work. Okay, I'm disappearing. Apologies for interrupting you, Gemma. No problem. Okay, so I'll introduce myself. Um, I am Hélène Collin. I started a sustainable climbing uh, company about three years ago. So I um, handmade show bags from um, reclaimed and upcycled material. And I really got into sustainability when I uh, switched job. So I used to be a scientist and I can do much more for the world as a scientist. So I decided to be a bit more proactive about it. And this is why I created Symbios Climbing. And uh, with Gemma, we didn't know each other before doing this talk, but it's a great pleasure that we've worked on it. I think we've learned a lot. And so Gemma, you can start. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself again quickly. So um, my name's Gemma. I um, I don't actually work in anything to do with climbing. I'm actually a, a language tutor and a yoga instructor as well. Um, and sustainability has been something that's become just more and more important to me um, over the last couple of years. Um, and being part of this with Helen has been an awesome opportunity um, for me to kind of learn uh, more and discover more as well. And obviously the sharing ideas um, with Helen has been, um, has been, yeah, really, really fantastic. Um, so first of all, let's kind of um, make sure we're all in the same boat. So um, we're going to go through just a couple of the key terms. Uh, first of all, sustainability itself. So what is sustainability? Um, that's the ability of something to be maintained or to continue at the same rate or level, um, basically indefinitely. Um, so nowadays we mostly use this to refer to the planet. So we talk about kind of not depleting the planet's resources or causing irreversible ecological damage. Um, but we're also going to talk about sustainability in, in a kind of a personal sense, as in um, talking about actions being sustainable for ourselves, something that we can maintain um, in the long term. Uh, the next one we've got there is policy making, um, and that's something that's gonna come up a lot. Um, the, it's the process of creating policies, basically. Um, so courses of action. And in this context, we're probably mostly talking about political policies. So those ones introduced by governments or maybe international organizations like um, the European Union or the United Nations. And finally, systemic. Um, so this is something that forms like an integral part of a system. So rather than being isolated to a particular area, um, for example, if we're talking about emissions from agriculture, um, they're not just limited to um, cows when they're methane, the lovely burps, but also uh, the process of ploughing, fertilizer production, machinery use, basically that whole system um, is occur incurring emissions. Um, it's I'm also going to just note here as well that we do have a document with all of our sources, um, key resources for you and a breakdown of the main points of the talk. So don't worry if you miss anything, you're, you're, you know, don't feel you have to be writing furiously um, uh, throughout this. You, you'll be able to sort of go back over that. Um, but you may want a pen or a pencil and some paper for a couple of activities that we've got partway through. Um, so, um, uh, over to you, Dave, we've already passed um, a key date in our sustainability calendar, and that is this Earth Overshoot Day. And that's just where our demand for resources like fish and crops and wood, it begins to exceed what the planet can regenerate or produce, reproduce within one single year. Um, this year, as we can see, it's happened on July the 29th. Um, it's the earliest date on record due to our accelerating consumption. Um, however, sustainability is, is not just uh, concerned with what we kind of take, what we consume, but also what we emit, what we're putting back. Um, and the rate of global emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases is currently at an unsustainable level, essentially, particularly in our Western nations, um, and it's only increasing. So the global warming that this, these emissions are causing, it's bringing us close to irreversible tipping points, which if we go past those points, it will lead to the collapse of ecosystems 
and potentially life as we know it, which is pretty scary. Um, most of you listening or watching, you're probably already aware of this, and maybe that's even why you're here. Maybe that's what's kind of brought you here. Um, I'm sure many of you have kind of felt as helpless as I've done in the face of all of this. Um, there are just so many issues when we um, to deal with um, when we're talking about sustainability and, and combating climate change as well. So it's easy to kind of get lost or feel overwhelmed and, and powerless. Um, the fact also that these issues are systemic, so they're built into the system, um, means it's almost impossible for us to make sustainable decisions um, until we actually change the system itself. Um, so this is one aspect that we'll be focusing on today, myself in particular, um, but also we want to give you answers to some of the big questions, um, some concrete ideas and techniques to move towards sustainability yourself, um, and most importantly, a bit of hope. Yeah, so Gemma, you said that it's the earliest we've had uh, Earth Overshoot Day, so mm -hmm. do you think it's already too late? Um, so the latest report from the IPCC, which is the International Panel on Climate Change, says no. The scientists believe we still have time, although it is rapidly running out. Um, big corporations have actually spent years and many millions of pounds, euros, dollars um, on sowing doubt about climate change. Um, or in more recent years, they've actually been trying to unload that responsibility onto us um, as individuals and kind of make us feel guilty for our, our own choices. Um, you can hear a bit more about that on um, how they made us doubt everything, which is a podcast. Um, but the reality is that most, emission, it, most of the emissions, they are actually out of our control. So um, as you can see from this lovely pie chart here, we've got 25% just comes from making electricity. 24% uh, goes to all, is uh, produced from food production and agriculture. 20% comes from industry. So that's making cement, steel, consumer goods. Um, and 15% is transport alone. Um, so these are all systemic issues, but therefore we need a response that changes the system. And that's where policymaking comes in. And to summarize, basically, it's not too late to introduce these policies to make these changes and save the planet. So if, if systemic changes and policymaking are key, um, is there anything we can do as individuals or do, do our actions even matter then? It's, yeah, it's a question I've asked myself a lot. Um, the reality is that of that kind of total uh, global carbon footprint or those the kind of total emissions um, from the entire planet, if we take the average American footprint, it's one of the largest ones, um, as in most Western nations, um, that accounts for 0 0.000000000. 0003%. So that's nine zeros in case you missed one. Um, so even if we make all of the right decisions, we emit no carbon, the effect is actually negligible. So whittling down our own carbon footprint won't solve the crisis. So, so you're just saying that there's nothing we can do? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> we have a really incredibly important tool in our voice. So every change we make, it can become something really significant if we view that as an opportunity to talk to others, to invite others to take that step with us, if we make some ripples. Just as the wonderful Lena, Lena Drapella, portrayed in her, her documentary that she made, which was aptly named Ripple Effect, um, we have an incredible power to influence those around us. Um, and we need to do so because policy change is only going to come about if we have enough people supporting those policies. Um, so essentially our overarching aim, it should be to create the conditions that will lead to systemic change. Uh, the really good news here is that we have uh, the solutions to a lot of these issues already. Um, George Monbiot in particular, he's done tons of research and he's proposed a lot of solutions to sectors like transport, to sectors like cement production. Um, and you can read more about that in his book, Heat. Um, so what we need to ask ourselves on an individual level is how can I extend my impact? How can I make ripples? 
And we're going to explore that now. So we've gone to our first little activity already, and we're going to have a go at drawing our ripples. So Helen, feel free to join in with this one as well. Um, so hopefully you've got your paper, pen or pencil, and we're going to start with, you can see in the middle, we've got a small circle. So let's start with that central circle and we can write me. So you're going to write for yourself, me in there, um, just as we've got on the screen there. And then once you've got that first one, you can start with the next circle. So you can see we've got a green one after that. You're, don't worry if you haven't got the colors for that. Um, and in that first one, I'm gonna write my family, uh, my partner, maybe my close friends. Um, and then you can just keep going essentially, keep working out from that little droplet that's you. And here's a nice one I made earlier. Thanks, Helen. Um, so you can see um, some people might put their colleagues in there. Um, personally, I would put my students because obviously I don't actually have colleagues as I'm self-employed. Um, and then just keep moving out through those ripples. Maybe you've got your extended family. Um, consider the places that you've got a membership or perhaps the companies or businesses that you're a customer of. Because um, obviously as a customer, we still have that influence, that power to create some change. So Helen, what are you putting in your, maybe your second or your third ripples? Um, my second ripple is my mom. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and my boyfriend yeah. uh, and my family. And uh, in the third one, I have my climbing community, maybe, maybe yeah. I I'm too, awesome. mm -hmm. I'm too much in love with the people that surround me, but I <laughs> will put them in the first. No, well, that's the point. It's, it's totally like, personal. So we won't all have them in the same place. Yeah, my colleagues, my close friends, uh, my climbing community, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, in the fourth one, I would put my customers because they're lovely. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I didn't think about, you know, like banks and things. And usually we don't think about them, but they, they're really part of our daily life. I think mm -hmm. if I get a letter in my mailbox, that's probably uh, most of the time coming from my insurance or my bank more than my climbing community friends. So, <laughs> yeah. So of course they, they are in there. So mm -hmm. you say that the goal is to extend our impact basically by, by having a ripple effect. So how do we do that? Do we just throw share facts articles on social media in order to convince people or? So this is, uh, it's, yeah, this is a really important question. The answer is also no to this one. Um, there's this kind of common misconception that when someone's presented with hard facts, then it's just inevitable. They're gonna change their mind just like that. Um, but according to a sociologist, Brooke Harrington, who's um, on one of the podcasts, featured on one of the podcasts we've uh, got in our resources, um, we're actually dealing with kind of a socio-emotional issue. So essentially people are scared to change their beliefs or maybe change their vote, change their actions for fear of rejection by their social group. Um, so Brooke talks about um, social death essentially being worse than physical death. We're more scared of it. Um, so we literally do anything to avoid it. Um, and there's, I mean, there's even been instances of people kind of denying that they've got COVID while they're dying of COVID because that's their identity is that they don't believe COVID is real. You know, their social group believes it's a hoax. Um, and that's what makes these discussions so hard. Our, our ideas and our beliefs are part of our kind of wrapped up in our identity and, and how we view ourselves. Um, so if we feel this is threatened, we, we can, we're going to push back and probably hard as well. Um, for example, on our next slide, we've got a couple of, uh, a couple of good examples here. So imagine you're trying to convince someone who identifies as a champion hot dog eater. Yeah, maybe they're winning all the competitions, um, like all those, you know, fast eating competitions and you're trying to convince them to go vegan. Or maybe there's a beef farmer, the family's kind of passed the farm down through the generations, um, really looks after his cows. And if we can just skip onto the next slide, we might even get a nice 
oh, okay, no, maybe I've, um, <laughs> I've made it up. Um, anyway, so yeah, imagine you've got you've got this bee farmer, the family's passed the farm down through the generations, um, and you're asking them essentially to change everything that makes them proud of themselves, to change essentially the core of their identity. Yeah. And so yeah, with hard. these people, like the, there's a lot, of, I, I know that I'm very opinionated, I'm a very opinionated person. And sometimes mm -hmm. when people are trying to convince me, um, they probably doing it the wrong way. And same for myself, when I'm talking about something, this is, I'm very opinionated. So how do you suggest we can approach people, start a discussion about climate change or sustainability in general? Um, so first of all, um, we need to ask permission essentially, or kind of invite the person into the conversation. Um, maybe you kind of invite them and say, oh, at a later date, I, I'd like to talk about this with you. I'd like to go in deeper with, um, on this, this topic. Um, and so it should be then kind of in a safe space when you've got plenty of time um, with an actual genuine mutual respect. So you're not going to the conversation with at the back of your mind, oh, I'm right, but going into that conversation to listen to what the other person's going to say and, and trying to establish a common goal. Um, so the most important thing is it's working together. It's being partners in the conversation rather than turning yourself into these kind of opposing forces or teams. Um, so that's going to mean no shaming, no blaming. And no telling someone that they're wrong or, or they're doing wrong, essentially. So, so that's that's how you approach them. But then what's what the goal of a conversation should be? Um, so the most common mistake, as I kind of mentioned, is we go into the discussion with the aim of changing the person's mind, changing the other person's mind. And we've all been that I'm guilty of it, too. Like, it's just human nature. But unfortunately, it's not the most effective way. And it, it only leads essentially to both parties being dissatisfied and it can even cause damage to relationship. Um, so instead, we should enter the conversation with the goal of learning something, uh, of listening, and maybe even improving the relationship. The, the sharing of your ideas should actually come much later on and, and only if the other person's really open to it. Um, it's natural, we all kind of want to be there for that epiphany moment, that light bulb moment where suddenly, Eureka, the other person like sees the light, they're on board. Um, and occasionally we might get to be part of that. But above all, we need to treat this as a process uh, and see the value in every single conversation because each one is gonna open that person up a little bit more, a little fraction more, and allow them to be more receptive to the next conversation or the next event. Yeah, so you you seem really keen on that. So can you can you give us uh, some techniques to use? Because that's that might be really useful. Yeah, it's it's hard kind of it, well, it's all well and good kind of talking about it, but putting it into action is something else, isn't it? Um, so you're not so smart, which is um, the podcast Brooke Harrington's on, um, and I just kind of recently listened to. It suggests uh, a golden question um, that we can use in these situations. So first of all, you ask a question where you give the other person a choice, one to ten. So one being the lowest, ten being the highest. Um, and that can be their response. Uh, so, for example, you might ask, um, to what extent do you believe climate change is caused by humans? Or how important is it that we work to prevent climate change? Or maybe something a bit more specific, like how likely are you to travel less by a plane to reduce your carbon footprint? And if the person answers with one, the lowest number, they're probably not in the right place uh, at that time to continue the discussion. But it's something you can come back to with them. If they reply with a lower number, uh, sorry, a higher number, <laughs> nothing lower than one in this one, um, then that's when you can pull out the golden question. And the golden question is, why did you not choose a lower number? So why did you not choose a lower number? So essentially, instead of asking them to repeat and then consolidate the reasons that they have their current belief, you actually start to explore the reasons that they might be persuaded to change their mind, to believe differently or behave differently. Um, and then you can kind of maybe talk about the sources that they trust or, or why they hold these ideas, where they've kind of come from. Yeah, so, 
so if you have a, a really good conversation with one person that that doesn't happen very often but mm -hmm. sure. we do we do more have like light conversation about sustainability in our day-to-day -day dialogue so mm -hmm. how what if you want to start to include sustainability into this uh, lighter conversation without diving into uh, a bigger more intense conversation yeah um again the most important thing is not to alienate others by any kind of lecturing or shaming um in in any kind of type of conversation um so a simple tactic that i've kind of used recently is putting yourself in the same boat um by saying to someone maybe oh i've just found out that oh did you know this so you can then kind of explain what you've done or your response to this this discovery of this bit of information and then and that kind of suggests a way forward but you're not forcing it on them you're not saying you need to do this you have to do this um so um for example uh recently i decided to uh i switched banks and so i used that decision as an opportunity to get other people involved to create some of those ripples um, and so as a language tutor, I've got students that have been with me for years. Um, so you can probably imagine they've already been exposed to some environmental ideas, <laughs> some kind of thoughts on sustainability, <laughs> just one or two. Um, so this time I thought, right, well, they need to know my bank details. So I'm going to send out an email saying, wow, I've just discovered my current bank is still investing in fossil fuels. And so I'm switching to such and such. Um, some students didn't really acknowledge it, just like, yeah, thanks, let, thanks for letting me know. Um, others kind of commented that, oh, wow, I also was in the dark about this. I didn't know that, like, we're in the same place. Um, but one student actually asked me for more information and he's now switched banks too, yeah. which was really exactly. exciting. I'm sure you can imagine. I was like, yeah, little win. Um, but it doesn't mean that he's the only person I affected. So he was just at a different stage in the process. If we imagine, you know, he was already at eight or nine, kind of thinking on that one to 10 scale. Um, but, and every email like this that we send out, it's, it's worthwhile, it's valuable. It's bringing it into the dialogue and it's one more bit of exposure to this issue of the climate crisis. Yeah. So before Helen continues with uh, her section of the talk, um, I'd like to kind of start you off on your own personal journey to sustainable change and to creating those ripples. So we've had a think about where we might, sort of what context we might be able to bring sustainably, sustainability into, where we might be able to have some influence. Um, but now we're going to have a, a, uh, another um, kind of drawing exercise again. So you can see here in the presentation, we've got a simple diagram, three circles. And I borrowed this from the awesome team at How to Save a Planet, which has become one of my favorite podcasts. Um, so go ahead, grab your pen and draw yourself those three circles. Um, try and make them nice and big so you've got space to write in them. And then when you've got your circles, in the top one, you can see we've got our joy. So in this one, you're gonna write down a few things that you love or that you love to do. You're gonna assume that everyone writes some type of climbing in there. <laughs> um, and maybe, um, yeah, maybe um, other things as well, of course. Um, next one on the left, we've got some, our skills. So what we're good at. So maybe you're amazing at knitting um or you've got really good time management maybe you can touch your tongue to your nose you feel like you're going to include that as well it's it's a I skill can't. people <laughs> I, I can't can. do it <laughs> and then finally in the third circle we've got climate and justice solutions so you're going to choose some that again they're personal to you something you care about um it could be composting and soil could be renewable energy uh it could be raising awareness so and I'm, I'm not gonna ask you to kind of complete the whole thing right now, but start to start out, jot down a few ideas. Um, and then essentially where we're going with this is you start to draw the ideas together. You start to kind of create some links. Um, and then you can find an area for you personally to focus on. 
um, there won't be only one answer. So you might like to do this a couple of times, or perhaps you do one specific to your workplace or specific to your social life. Um, and if you're struggling, show it to your friends, see if they can maybe draw some different links and, and find something for that little central bubble there of what you should do. And of course, do you feel free to share them with us too. We'd love to see what you guys have come up with. So you can obviously pop them on Instagram and tag Women's Bouldering um, and we'll look out for those. Okay, so over to you, Helen. But our, so first of all, um, what we're gonna talk about the kind of more concrete actions in this section or Helena's. Um, so what kind of actions can we take as individuals to make our own environment more sustainable? Yeah, so you summarize that sustainability is, is a systemic problem. So basically it depends on us slightly, but mainly on, on policies. And we've seen that we have this problem for generations now and the big leaders, the deciders have not yet found the solution. And so when I read about sustainability, what uh, came up was really maybe we're thinking about this problem the, the wrong way. And that reminded me a um, uh, quote that one of my physics teacher gave us uh, from Albert Einstein, which says, we cannot solve uh, problems with the same thinking we use to create them. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically I thought, okay, so maybe we should see uh, sustainability not as a problem, but more uh, think positive and see it as an opportunity an opportunity to educate ourselves, just like we did uh, to uh, have this presentation today, the both of us, but also to reframe ourselves, to just uh, think a little bit outside the box and just put ourselves out there and, and share also all our ideas uh, with others. And you just explain how we can have an influence uh, just by doing that, so. Okay, and so, uh, how does that then translate into uh, into our lives? You know, talking about kind of everyday life yeah. um, and the, all the daily turmoil that comes comes with that. Yeah, so it's 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 always the tricky part because it's mm -hmm. nice to talk about big things and how we should change the world, but on our daily life, this is uh, not so easy to do. And when I started looking into that, I saw a lot of blogs popping up and things on Instagram and social media about five tips towards sustainability or 10 advice to have for a more sustainable life. And basically mm -hmm. uh, the base, uh, they were based on how we created the problem. And our approach to sustainability is not what you should read on a blog, but more a highly personal uh, approach. And, and it depends on our needs and on the things that make us happy. And I think the Venn diagram is uh, that you just presented to us is a really, really good place to start. So I, I did the exercise. Um, and so when I saw that, I thought immediately about food. <laughs> I really like to eat. Yeah. I really like to cook. And so uh, what I'm good at is invent recipes uh, from scratch with random ingredients and how to combine them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes me really happy to have friends over, especially now I have a garden so we can have a lovely time in the garden. So I, I often organize uh, what I call the covered cooking with scrub dinners for friends. So basically I take cans that are about to expire um, and, and food from the fridge that doesn't look that good and I make a good dinner. And that way, this is a good way to have a lovely time with friends, but also really reduce my food wastes. Mm -hmm. So this Venn diagram is a good place to start. You can do that for a lot of things. Actually, I did another one while you were presenting it. And uh, right. today I had uh, some flowers in the garden. Um, I do not have a super green farm, but yet I'm trying really hard. And I've seen a lot of bees coming to these flowers. So that's a nice way to provide some food for pollinators. And so that's a small action again that mm -hmm. uh, everyone can do. The second, uh, I think for me, really important thing um, 
is the free, what I call the free seas rule. Uh, so be creative, be curious, and be critical. So what does that all mean? Uh, first, uh, being creative, try to think outside the box for solutions uh, towards sustainability in your daily life. But also you got to be curious, educate yourself on sustainable matters. Uh, just, uh, but also don't take it all, be critical, challenge opinions, the things that you read, common knowledge, and challenge uh, other people's thoughts as well. And that's, that's really important. Yeah, I re I like that. I I really love how kind of simple that that process is, um, or the 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 idea of it. Um, can you give us kind of a couple of examples or like a real life example of this? Yeah, I can. <laughs> so when I moved to my new place, I had to choose an electricity company. Uh, this is the kind of things that I really don't like to do, but I tried to implement it. Uh, I was like, okay, I want a more sustainable life. I'm gonna have a garden. Uh, so I want to uh, do good and choose a good electricity company. So first I was curious. I was like, okay, in my area, uh, where does the electricity come from? Is it powered by water? Is it powered by wind? Is it fossil fuel? Um, it happens that the company that I had before was mainly fossil fuel. So I decided to be critical, change company. So I wondered if any of the local companies that I could choose from were green. And it happens that some of them had green energy. So I choose these, but to choose, I phoned them and I asked. And I phoned the customer service and I asked a bunch of questions and people, some people got really annoyed, but I did it all. And also now um, we're trying to be creative with electricity. So we, you know, we have electricity for light and many things, but um, because we have this garden and we live in a very sunny part of France, uh, we uh, are currently trying to install a solar panel uh, with a little battery and we could plug our phones on it and our computers, which is uh, total awesome. green energy produced by us. Mm -hmm. So let's think if you're creative, you could think that you have some friends that are engineer at school and need a project and just tell them, okay, let's let's build a wind, a wind turbine in my garden. So don't forget to be creative. Great. And the second example, you know, I told you I really like to eat. <laughs> so, uh, is And that's something that happens to uh, most of us is going out for dinner with friends. Uh, so I will start with the creative part because again, I have an anecdote. Uh, so I visited uh, London, I think it was three or four years ago with a friend and uh, it's hard to get around because that's a huge city. We didn't want it to take a cab because it's fossil fuel, uh, it's a transport from fossil fuel. And in the tube, you basically don't see London because you're underground. So we rented a tender to go around the city Nice. And especially because I wanted to go to a restaurant that was recommended to me that was a bit uh, outside of town. So creative transport. And we had a lot of fun because I tell you, riding a tandem when, you, when you're not good at riding a back, bike is really hard. <laughs> so, and, and now that I go to, when I go to a restaurant, I'm always curious. I ask whether the ingredients are seasonal, whether they're local. And even if they're not, you plant a seed in the waiter's or the restaurant owner's mind that you're thinking about it. So maybe they should think about it. And also be critical. So I lived abroad for 10 years. I was basically vegetarian. I came back to France and I, I was in shock. Well, I kind of knew, but French people are big meat eaters. So when you go to a restaurant, you have 90% chance to not have a vegetarian or a vegan option. Uh, so now I'm critical. And every time I go to a restaurant in France, I suggest it. And mm -hmm. again, even if they don't have a, an, an option, a menu, a vegan option, if more and more people ask for it, maybe they will switch to a healthier and better for the planet option. Yeah, that's a really awesome way to use the, the power of your voice again, yeah. essentially. Um, and so kind of by doing this, by challenging the way we consume goods and services, are you saying we're going to influence others? And do you think that's going to work again for policies? Yeah, I, I think so. I, 
I think we do have, if we all work towards these kind of things, we're going to have an, in, an impact and an influence. And especially when it comes to consuming goods and buying things. So I want to play a little game. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I want to play this game. Uh, so here are 36 logos. Uh, can you put the company names on these logos? I'm going to put a timer and you have 30 seconds to do that. All of you, please try. Let's go. Ten seconds left. The pressure. Yeah. Dan. Okay, so I cannot hear you all, so I'm gonna ask Gemma. Gemma, how many <laughs> you got? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm a slow ten. writer, clearly, that's but I, I could have done more. <laughs> you can have done more. So that's a third. Um, and my second question is: Have you used any of these companies? Uh, me personally, uh, yeah. yeah, one of them's uh, one of the ones I switched away from actually <laughs> recently. Okay. But um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I know the one actually. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so if you use some of these companies, but not as many as you can name, right? Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. no, only so, a couple really. Yeah. So how come is that? It's because it's estimated that a consumer is exposed to an ad advertise some form of advertisement three hundred times a day. That's one ad every five minutes, whether it's visual, whether you hear it, whether you see it, that's huge. Mm -hmm. So every, I want you to think about it because every five minutes, you unconsciously uh, influence to make choices for the way uh, you consume. And I think this is very unhelpful and it's even harmful when it comes to making good choices about uh, to promote sustainability. So, uh, this this occurs um, so this consumerism pushing consumerism occurs in in every part of uh, where the carbon footprint is huge. So for energy companies, food production, the industry, transport, everything. So mm -hmm. that's a lot. So I suggest that uh, when it comes to consuming, which is a, a huge part of uh, our carbon footprint, is to reframe myself, ourselves. Uh, so basically, these companies that we've seen, all of these logos, uh, some of them are evil, um, tell you to think that I am a consumer. The way it's phrased is very passive, and that involves uh, you not thinking about it. Instead, each time that uh, you see an ad, think, oh, I consume. So I'm very pro proactive towards the way I consume and I have to think about it. So this is a, a very important thing. Um, and basically to conclude on this, how uh, we can change at the individual level. We cannot be on, on all fronts all the time. We, mm. we have very busy lives and, uh, and so it's, it's it's really hard to make good choices all the time, but every little things that you do counts. And just like um, Gemma mentioned, talking about sustainability, joking about it, uh, spreading the word, challenging uh, your thoughts, your friends' thoughts is highly important. Even challenging your local council. Uh, mm -hmm. Since we had this, uh, you know, our all our interactions, I got more, uh, more interested into my local council and the choice they were making. And I think I'm gonna raise my voice for some of the things. So um, all of that remains the best strategy. And uh, I mentioned that, but before doing this talk with you, I didn't know you. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so when we chatted about uh, on our first video call, you, say, you said something that really resonates and I think is key here. You said leading a sustainable uh, life starts with being sustainable with yourself and respecting yourself. And I truly think that um, this is the key uh, to success in all of our actions towards sustainability. 
Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I would say that like our collaboration on this talk is, is actually been proof of these methods in action. You know, we've uh, we've been discussing and just as you've kind of taken on board what I've said. So so your ideas, Helen, have have influenced me as well. Um, so particularly what struck me from all of the research we've done and all of our discussions is essentially beating ourselves up over making the best, the most low carbon, climate friendly decision every time is, is not productive. Yeah. Um, and if those are financial or consumer choices, um, just as Helen's been outlining here, we should, we should aim to put our money into companies that share our ethics and our values, but not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, so talking about the changes that we do make, it's got so much more power than bring our footprint to zero. Um, so we need to consider our sphere of influence, who we can affect, how we can extend our impact. And when we're in those conversations, instead of aiming for that kind of light bulb epiphany moment, that kind of conversion from atheist or agnostic to believer, yes, sustainability is, is the right way. Um, we should set a goal instead of a reproduction rate, rate of 1.1. So we've all seen what happens when the R rate tips over one, that brings in the lockdowns. Um, so if we can spread our ideas to just more, just a little bit more than one other person, if we can share our sustainable swaps or our sustainable actions, with just over one person, then pretty soon there will be enough support behind the policies to change the whole system. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I think we're probably ready for questions there, aren't we? Yeah, thank you so, for listening to us and playing our games. <laughs> yeah, I hope that you've uh, got some, yeah, got some nice ideas down and please do add to them. Don't let it stop yeah. here. Um, you know, we've only had a limited amount of time now, but go back to those and take your time over them um, and find something that's, yeah, personal, personally sustainable. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's going to work for you. Thank you okay. so much, guys. That was incredibly full of hope, I guess. That's what I want to say. Um, there is hope to be had <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah sure. that's that's a that's a nice message to 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 have at the end of this talk and um i would like to ask if the participants have any questions um to to ask please pop them in the q a box at the moment and um if not i guess um i have a question and my question is um how can you make sure that like you don't you don't go to that tipping point of noticing you, you said a lot like focus on what you can do and not about what you're not doing but it's very hard sometimes to draw the line somewhere as to you know compromise maybe your well-being emotionally and just feel really really down for not doing the right thing like I personally experienced that a lot and mm -hmm. so how do you sort of absolve yourself of that guilt um actually one um one of my housemates um talked to me about this a little while ago and um someone had shared with her this kind of theory of um of the spoons <laughs> the theory of the spoons and so essentially it's um, the idea that you only have so much energy in the day. Um, so you imagine that at the start of the day, you have this number of spoons. So say you've got 10 spoons, for example. And as you go through the day, you notice, oh, okay, I've used a spoon there. That kind of took some energy out of me. That took some motivation. Um, and then if you get to the end of the day and you've run out of spoons, you've run out of spoons and that's okay. But tomorrow they're going to refresh. So you get another chance. Um, I think that's, can be a, a quite a helpful way to look at it and and you know it's almost out of your hands then you know you're like okay I've got no more spoons you know that and that's that's it um but yeah I completely understand where you're coming from um and um I think um as always doing something that is relevant to you relevant to your skills and your passions you're going to be so much more effective uh, at making uh, making an impact if you focus on that and on on, on influencing other people 
Um, and even more so if you're well, well rested um, and you're really kind of with it. Um, so I think prioritizing that kind of self-care is, is something that a lot of us, are, myself included, are not very good at. But we should include that essentially as part of that kind of action, you know, so that we are better, so that we are more effective at then communicating and and making the changes that we do want to. Thank yeah, you. I, I think for, yeah, for the guilt, because I get that guilt pretty much all the time, mm. and it's horrible. So I just uh, try to not blame yourself, and uh, it's easy to say do not have guilt, but it's like you're just like oh well, that's for now. But I did just think about all the other actual sustainable choices that you've made before and 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 remind remind that to yourself you know like oh yeah but i did that and i did that and probably next month i'm going to do that so i shouldn't feel ashamed about that or guilty like mm -hmm. this is good because that's that was Gemma's conclusion this is really unsustainable to yeah. uh blame yourself and feel guilty so. yeah mm -hmm. this actually i think i'll be thinking about the spoons i don't know why they're yeah. spoons but i'll be thinking about yeah. them because um it kind of highlights also how we're raised in this society which mm -hmm. is so individualistic that we mm -hmm. even feel like the weight of the whole world on the mm -hmm. shoulders of just ourselves and yeah. obviously we're as a individual like on one hand we're really important because we can have that ripple effect but on another like we can't do everything yeah mm -hmm. and it's a tricky balance yeah. yeah yeah I think searching you know searching for support from your friends and your family as well is is really important and it's only going to make the bonds then that you have with them better yeah. um, and improve your relationships so uh, um yeah just as you're saying kind of trying to move away from that individual uh, individualistic focus as well. and on the notion of uh, influencing people around us i am absolutely shocked that my mother who has self-identified as a meat eater five times a day meat 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 is now not only not buying meat but she's even avoiding dairy and buying vegan cheeses and and i can't believe it and i know to a large extent, it wasn't only my influence because she keeps educating herself. herself he, she, he, he, she keeps looking around herself for information and solutions. But for sure, the conversations that I had with her must have had an impact. So mm -hmm. that is just like, you know, she's a nearly 70 year old lady who's just going vegetarian. Yeah, yeah that's but awesome. I, that, that's really important because uh, most of the time you think that you do not have an influence, but maybe you don't talk to people about it. So when I met my partner, he, I think he was eating two vegetables, which included potatoes. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we were going from far and now he's absolutely delighted when we have new uh, courgettes in, in the garden. So, but it's because well, I think, you know, I'm very opinionated, but that's the one time where I took things slow and introduce concept and why eating so much meat is bad and why eating vegetable is good by talking about how this may influence his climbing too, you know, and food is really important for people that do sports in general, but especially for climbing. So by talking about it just uh, every time for, a, a, you know, a light when we had dinner or when we cooked is very important. Yeah. yeah, that's part of a day-to-day -day conversation. Yeah, it made a huge mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. Something that also I always think about when it comes to sustainability, and I wanted to ask your opinion about it, is to what degree living a sustainable life or thinking even to live a sustainable life is a privilege? Because, you know, <laughs> now, Ellen, you moved into a house with a garden. I've got a garden. I don't know, Gemma, about you in Hanberis, but, you know, we can make those really privileged choices of planting flowers for the bees of, or growing our own courgettes. But um, I kind of feel like the more privileged a person is, the more they can do. And it's really important to acknowledge that some people, for whatever reasons, might just not 
have that in their scope at wherever they are with mm-hmm. their life whether yeah, it be absolutely. personal or like systemic they might just not be able to do it and like that's fine like I, I think that you know like you just need to get on with your life if you if you if you can't reduce your plastic in your life because you're struggling financially yeah. then you can't feel guilty I don't I Very mean true. it's hard but yeah absolutely but I think um as you kind of mentioned in that the often the more privileged nations are actually responsible for the largest portion of the emissions and the impact anyway um and so we as the part of those nations we do actually you know potentially have um have kind of more space to make changes as well um but that is also why i think i don't know if you noticed but in our venn diagram we've also got like justice solutions um so um it's a it's an area of sustainability that i really want to learn more about i don't feel like i'm quite kind of um have grasped everything yet but i'm kind of yeah i'm teaching i'm learning um and this is something that comes up as well on um, how to save a planet and the podcast i kind of mentioned earlier um and so yeah kind of looking at the inequality that's also systemic but then ends up built into the kind of um the emissions um and the impact as well um and that sort of so one of the examples was that often um the sort of ethnic minority communities are the ones that end up living next to uh fossil fuel power plants or suffering because their water is polluted in the area that they live um and yeah obviously you know um not everyone has the time the luxury of time or money perhaps as well to to be able to make those changes and that's why we need to make the changes into the system because then people will be doing it without even having to make a choice it will be built in it will be you know legislated um and and then you know it it doesn't come down to the luxury yeah um, and i would say that the other inequalities along the way sorry yeah because i think yeah that's something that probably we didn't mention but yeah when you read about sustainability you have we often think about climate change but like uh social inequalities is definitely a huge worldwide is one of the biggest sustainable problem on our planet so yeah something to for sure think about yeah and um because we are running out of time at the moment i would like to finish this session by asking both of you to answer i don't know Gemma, how you're gonna feel about this question because as you said you're not that but you do climb so yeah oh yeah, yeah. i'm a climber so you're yeah. not like just uh-huh. working in the industry but you're a climber yeah. obviously mm-hmm. but maybe because um Ellen, you actually work in the industry you might have some um additional Different, insights yeah. here we've got a question what would you consider yeah. to be the biggest sustainability issue within the climbing community? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, well, for, for me, travel? The climb, yeah, well, travel, yeah. And uh, well, it depends if you think about the climbing industry or the climbing community. I would say in the climbing industry is um, the gears, like there's, uh, there's not often much way to recycle our gears because our life depend on it. So maybe, maybe, but more and more companies, like we have a list actually in the, in the little resources document we've made about really good companies that are thinking about that. And when I think as me, as a climber in a community, I think the biggest problem is that there's loads of people that are climbing now, like the the community shift a bit into uh, from dirt bags <laughs> that knew a lot about climbing to a new generation that uh, climbs more in the gym and does, is not uh, very aware of the rules outside. So toilet paper uh, erosion for font, Fontainebleau, how to behave in in uh, in a climbing area, respecting the rules. Like this is nature. This is not a climbing gym when you go outside. This is nature. Mm-hmm. So I think to me the yeah, that's it. Which is a sort of savoir vivre of being outdoors. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Gemma, what would you say? Yeah, I I agree that there's this shift and that sort of historically climbers have actually been fairly 
uh, were obviously exposed to nature and therefore a little bit more in tune with um, kind of natural processes and, and sort of the base concepts then of, of sustainability. Um, I think, um, yeah, definitely kind of gear production is a big one because it has such a short lifespan, a lot of it, obviously, because it's for personal protection. Um, we end up kind of throwing away preemptively or kind of just in case. Um, and so making that into more of a closed loop system would dramatically reduce the, the impact, I think, of the, the climbing community, the climbing industry. Um, and then I think also a sort of more so in, in, in Britain, where we're blessed with less wonderful weather. Um, as you kind of mentioned, the, the, the idea of this kind of winter sun getaway, which is, is often quite sort of just generally assumed to be the thing to do, um, and maybe sort of starting to challenge those um, concepts, or at least just challenge the kind of the use of, um, of air travel as part of it. Not saying don't do it, but um, obviously, you know, try and explore or trying to explore different options um, could be um, it can be yeah a, a great way to to make it more sustainable um, but again I think a lot of the major issues are, are, are systemic they're built into the, the system currently sure. um, but, but yeah as Helen said there are some great options on our on our list of uh, golden companies that will uh, that are doing trying their best to kind of create a closed loop system or at least recycle um, and use up um, all the kind of odds and ends of production as well. So if you wouldn't mind sending me those notes and lists that you made um, either tonight or tomorrow morning, I'll then send them together with the link to the replay of this talk, which will be available on YouTube as of tomorrow morning. Great. Um, thank you so much, guys. I kind of must congratulate myself on the brilliant idea of pairing you two because you did a <laughs> splendid job and um, you left me feeling very uplifted and inspired. And I hope our participants feel the same. And um, thank you ever so much and have a fantastic evening. Thanks, Thanks. for having us. It's been thank great. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks to everyone who joined. Bye.